Um, we live in the overlap of two ages, uh, the present age of sin and death and the coming age of Christ's complete reign. But we're no longer just in the age of fallen humanity because Christ has come and ushered in his kingdom into this age. We live in the age of already but not yet. Romans 8.30 says that we are glorified and Ephesians 2.6 says that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms as if these were already completed acts because in a very real sense they are. But we don't feel very glorified or at least I don't most of the time and our surroundings do not much resemble the heavenly realms. And that's because the present spiritual reality does not yet match up with the future physical reality. One day, soon or in many years, who knows, but one day the two will be in sync. Uh, Tim introduced us to the opening chapter of 1 Peter last week. And in those first 12 verses, Peter describes salvation majestically. He focused in those verses on the nature of salvation and began to look at the greatness of our salvation, so great that the prophets and even the angels longed for its appearing. How amazing that grace is. And how much do we need regular reminders of how great that grace is. Well, today we come to verse 13 and there's a definite shift in Peter's thoughts. Up to this point, all the verbs he's been using are stating facts. And now they begin to make commands. The facts of salvation have been stated and here are the commands. What we must do in response to the unmeasurable grace that God has already poured out on us. Salvation has been described and now the duty to those who have received it is commanded. These are exhortations based on the great privilege of receiving the free gift of salvation. I'm only going to concentrate on verses 13 to 17 because hopefully afterwards you'll see that the following verses, if we get these verses 13 to 17 right, will be the natural outworking of God's children living in God's way as strangers and exiles in this world. A motto or a slogan for you to follow today's sermon in your head and hopefully keep at the forefront of your minds every day is hopeful, holy, fearful, exiles or aliens or strangers or foreigners, whichever words you want to use, in this world. Um, Hopefully you've got your Bibles open there at 1 Peter um, because the word therefore at the beginning of verse 13 as always, is a word of transition. It takes us from statement to application. And the main emphasis of verse 13 is, set your hope. Peter is stating a direct, um, in the Greek, almost a military command, a command for duty on the part of every Christian that calls for an act of the will more than just an emotional feeling. Set or fix or anchor your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his second coming. Because we have been saved and because God has given us this great gift of salvation, he says, fix your hope. Not so much an obligation that we have, just the right response to such an amazing grace poured out on us. Live in hope. Now, hope is a great thing. 1 Corinthians 13 says that these things, three things will remain, faith, hope, and love. Now, you've heard plenty of sermons on love. You've seen plenty of books on love. You've heard plenty of sermons on faith and seen plenty of books on faith. But have you ever heard a sermon or read a book on hope? For some reason, we seem to have somehow ignored that. And particularly in our culture, hope is a missing element of our Christian experience. We don't really live in hope, and I think primarily it's because we really like this life too much. 
But more on that later. So what is hope? Well, it's the Christian's attitude toward the future. Hope in its essence is the same substance as faith. It is trusting God and it is believing God. Only faith is believing God in the present and hope is believing God for the future. Faith is trusting God for the present. Hope is trusting God for the future. To put it another way, faith accepts and hope expects. Faith believes God for what he has done and hope believes God for what he has promised, for what he will do. <clears throat> Peter says, God has done all this, so characterise your life by setting your hope. In other words, to live for the future, not just tomorrow or next week or next year, but your eternal future. Anticipate the glorious fulfilment of his future promise. This is a command. Set your hope. And you'll notice that after the word hope comes the word fully. Fix your hope completely. Fix your hope unreservedly. Once for all, fix your hope unalterably, without doubt, on the one who saved you. Not half-heartedly, not indecisively, but with finality. <laughs> this great and gracious God who saved us, this great and gracious God who by grace was generous, generous to us beyond description, who proved himself able to forgive our sins, to provide the perfect sacrifice in Christ on the cross and his resurrection to redeem us. This God who totally transformed us is worthy of our confident trust for the future as he has proven himself worthy of our confident trust in the present. If he has been faithful in the past, which we know that he has, he will be faithful in the present and he will be faithful in the future. And we are to live in the light of that future. What he promised he will do. Peter has already introduced that if you look back up at verse 3. We are, Peter says, born again to a living hope. Hope should characterise our life, a living hope, a hope for an inheritance. Verse 4, that inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, which is reserved in heaven for us, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at that last time. And we are to live in the hope of that eternal inheritance. Specifically, Paul is saying, in the grace that is to be given us when Jesus returns. In the original, it is in the present tense. It is being brought. So surely is it going to happen, Peter speaks of it as if it is currently happening. Then, when he wrote, and now, and into the future. Grace amazes us now when we comprehend it. And it will be no less amazing when Jesus returns. Our salvation is all of grace and none of us. When Jesus returns, no matter how long we have been a Christian, no matter what we might have done for him, our iner eternal inheritance will be all of grace and none of us. And in fact, his grace will be magnified when he returns as we will see him as he really is. To live in hope then means to live in the light of the second coming, of the bodily resurrection, of the new heaven and the new earth. Your hope is to look to Christ's second appearing, when he comes to reward and glorify his people with grace upon grace upon grace. The day when the whole redemptive work that has begun will be completed. The culmination of our salvation. Is that how you live day by day? Be honest. Is that what you look forward to? The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians 1. For to me, to live is Christ 
And to die is gain. To die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Put your hand up if you agree with that statement. To die and be with Christ is better by far. Come on, you can be hand raisers, it's okay. Okay, now no, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, don't be lazy. Now keep your hand up if that's how you live. You're allowed to keep them up, I'm putting mine down because I don't. <clears throat> we really need verse 13, don't we? To prepare our minds for action. Now the original is gird up the loins of your mind. Now hopefully most of you remember when Kayleen, uh, I think it was a kid's talk, and she gave an example of how you gird up, oh, well how a man in the um, Israelite times girded up his loins. But a man would tie up his long flowing robes in order to run, or more importantly, to fight. When an Israelite soldier went out to battle, the first thing he'd do is put his belt on and tie up his robe so that he didn't have it flying around everywhere, entangling him and causing him to be killed in hand-to-hand combat. Pull that robe together, which was saying, I am going into this battle deadly serious. Pulling in all the loose ends. I'm tying down everything that isn't tied down. Peter says, do that with your mind. Get your mind tied down. And he doesn't mean just the intellect. He's talking about the whole spiritual, intellectual and mental attitude. Decisively make up your mind to bring every thought captive to the reality of the grace that is coming in the return of Jesus Christ. Back in Exodus chapter 12, you might remember that God had told his people that they were going to go out of Egypt. They were going to be redeemed from slavery. And as they were preparing to leave Egypt and eating the Passover, he says to them in Exodus 12, verse 11, this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, so with your loins girded, unheard of in a Jewish household. Your sandals on your feet, again, unheard of in a Jewish household, having your shoes inside. Your staff in your hand, eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. In other words, you are ready to move. You are ready to go in an instant. And that's Peter's idea here. Fix your hope on the grace that is to come, to the unfolding of your eternal inheritance, and at any moment be ready to go. Do you see that? You are ready to move. Nothing here holds you. You are eating, but your staff is in your hand, your shoes are on your feet, your robe is pulled up, and you are ready to go. Just like the Jews were ready to leave Egypt when the Lord moved. He's saying, get your priorities right. Let nothing hinder your mind as you fix on that eternal hope. Prepare your mind to come out cleanly from the clutter of the world's attractions. Get yourself disentangled from the hindrances of this world and devote yourself to live in the light of the grace to come when Jesus returns. But I just don't think that we live that way. I think we are so caught up in this world that the thought of the coming of Jesus would be somewhat distressing to most of us. Paul said it this way in Colossians chapter 3, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Well, that's direct, isn't it? But again, do you live that way? Or maybe you've been a Christian so long that grace has lost some of its sweetness to you. Be honest, with the coming of Jesus Christ, if you knew it were going to happen tomorrow, would it be an intrusion in your life? Would it mess up your plans? We become so worldly in our affections, so worldly in our interests, that I believe if we are honest, we hope that Christ doesn't show up for a long time. 
And it's not necessarily because we've got some sins in our life that we think we need to tidy up. It's just that we don't want to have our plans messed up. I mean, we've got this big trip. We've been saving. We've got a caravan. Well, we've got a new grandchild to spoil. I mean, don't come till after the Sydney test, Lord. We've got tickets. That's how we live our lives, isn't it? So it's no wonder that we need to move down to verse 15 where we're commanded to be holy. They are closely connected ideas though because if you live in hope, as I've just described, you will live in holiness. If you live every moment with your mind captive, fixed on the grace that is to come, remembering what he has already done for us, anticipating the return of Jesus and all that that means, and if that's the focus and the longing and the love and the anticipation of your life, it's going to produce holiness. It can't do anything else. Holiness, whether it be as an attribute of God or what we as God's adopted children should be, holiness is another forgotten or misunderstood or misused word in our world. The holiness of God is one way of talking about God's otherness, his difference from us, his being in a class all by himself. Hannah put it like this in 1 Samuel 2, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. His holiness is transcendent, pure, absolute uniqueness. There is an infinite difference between him and us. Which means that when we see his holiness most clearly, we feel unworthy the same way that Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter 6. Woe is me, for I am lost, or I am doomed in some translations. For I am a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Several years after the night Chuck Colson became a Christian, uh, the same night that Watergate exploded into public view, the former White House hatchet man was repenting of a woefully inadequate view of God. A friend suggested to him that he watch a video lecture series by R.C. Sproul on the holiness of God. Here's what Colson writes in his book, Loving God. By the end of the sixth lecture, I was on my knees, deep in prayer, in awe of God's absolute holiness. It was a life-changing experience as I gained a completely new understanding of the holy God I believe in and worship. I think we could all do with a good dose of that holiness. What is your view of God? A loving father? A dad? Yes, he is those things. But we need to be careful not to get too casual with him. Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, I have seen the Lord of hosts. The root meaning of holy is to cut or to separate. A holy thing is cut off from and separated from the common use. Earthly things and persons become holy as they are made distinct from the world and devoted to God. So the Bible speaks of holy ground, of holy assemblies, a holy nation, holy garments, etc. But notice what happens when this definition is applied to God himself. From what can you separate God to make him holy? The very godness of God means that he is separate already from all that is not God. There is an infinite qualitative difference between creator and creature. God is one of a kind in a class by himself. In that sense, he is completely holy. His being and his character are utterly undetermined by anything or anyone outside of himself. He is not holy because he keeps the rules. He is the rules. He wrote the rules. 
God is not holy because he keeps the law. The law is holy because it reveals God. God is absolute and everything else is derived from him. Here is what John Piper says about God's holiness. It determines all that he is and does and is determined by no one or no thing. His holiness is what he is as God, which no one else is or ever will be. Call it his majesty, his divinity, his supreme greatness, his value as the pearl of great price. In the end, language runs out. In the word holy, we have sailed to the world's end in the utter silence of reverence and wonder and awe. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now let that sink in just for a few seconds because Peter wants us to what? Be holy in all you do just as he who called you is holy. It's no wonder Isaiah said, woe is me. God is described with many attributes, but it is really only this one that we are commanded to be. We aren't told to be omnipotent or omnipresent or sovereign. He tells us to love like him, but we are commanded to be holy as he is holy. So you can see why it's important that we have a good grasp of what his holiness is or means. But it also means that it is possible to be holy. One of Martin Lloyd-Jones's favourite sayings was, be what you are. If you're a Christian, you have been made holy. So be what you are. And Peter is saying that here too, isn't he? The one who called you is holy. The one that purchased you, not with perishable things, not even expensive perishable things like silver and gold, is holy. The one who gave his precious blood, a lamb without blemish or defect, literally a holy one, set apart for God, he is holy, so you be holy in all you do. And Peter tells us how in verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Literally, Peter says that we are children of obedience. Can you see the difference there? Not that we are well-behaved children, because we certainly aren't but that we are children who are born of obedience, born in the new birth. It's what we are. <clears throat> but as we are still of this world, we need to be reminded to be holy, to be pure, to be clean, to be righteous, to be sinless, to be separate from defilement, to cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. As 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, perfecting holiness. <clears throat> or Ephesians 5 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ also loved you. In other words, be like the one whose image you bear. Will we always do this? No, of course we won't. But it must be the pattern of our lives as God's adopted children. <clears throat> and importantly, we are no longer ignorant as we once were of what it means that God is holy and what that in turn means for us. When we were living in ignorance, we naturally conformed to those evil desires. When we were children of disobedience instead of children of obedience. It was what we naturally do. <clears throat> but our eyes have been opened. We can now see realities that others can't and that they think are ridiculous. We are no longer ignorant beasts and so should conform to the pattern of holiness that Jesus is, that God is. Which brings us finally to fear. Verse 17. 
Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Peter wants us to see the paradox because he calls the judge our father and he calls our father the judge. It's so that when you find yourself slipping toward presumption that your father's on the, the judge behind the bench, oh, it's all right for me, he reminds you that the judge will judge impartially according to each one's work. There are not different standards, one low standard for the judge's children and one high standard for all the others. Or on the other hand, when you are starting to feel lost and hopeless, he reminds you that this earthly life is only for you an exile for a short time. You are a stranger or an alien in this world. God really is your father and, heavenly, and heaven really is your home. Grace really is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And notice the connection between the command to fear in verse 17 and the statements in verse 18 and 19. Fear God because you were redeemed with something that is infinitely valuable and that will never, ever perish. Something that you can base your whole future on, your whole eternity on. In other words, conduct yourselves in fear because Christ paid infinitely to free you from eternal punishment. The fear of verse 17 is grounded in a few things. First of all, in the fact that God judges impartially according to our work. So live in fear. And then it's grounded in the fact that the judge is our father. Children live in fear. And then it's grounded in the fact that Christ ransomed us with precious and everlasting blood. And then in the fact that God raised him from the dead and has glorified him so that our hope alone would be in God. Should we fear God? I think if you don't, then you don't really know him or what he is like. But there is holy fear and there is unholy fear. Unholy fear runs away from the judgment on sin and looks for safety in all kinds of excuses and moral and religious camouflages. Holy fear runs away from the sin itself and looks for safety in the pardoning and empowering grace of God. Unholy fear ignores the preciousness of the ransom that has been paid and trembles at the judgment of God. Holy fear cherishes the ransom that's been paid and trembles at the prospect of insulting the goodness of the one who has paid it for you. Let me try and illustrate. Let's say I had a daughter. She was, say, 16 or 17 And she's been a bit of a problem child and I was a bit concerned about her. You know, hanging out with the wrong crowd, the wrong sort of people, hardly ever home, cold about spiritual things that she used to care about. But I love her like crazy and I'd lay my life for her an instant. Well, she was kidnapped by, as far as I can tell, some really bad guys. They sent a note, a demand for a ransom. And I decided in an instant that we would pay it. But of course we don't have that much cash, so we sell everything. Our house, our cars, all our machinery, some heirlooms, even wedding and engagement rings. We sell everything. I take the money to the place where they've arranged it so that she could come and get the money and give it to them and then she would be free to go with me. She walks out, picks up the money, I wave to her, hopefully I'm going to get her back. But as she turns around, she gives me the finger and walks off arm in arm with her captor. That's what I want us all to be afraid of, of doing that. Conduct your lives in fear because he has paid everything for you. Your father has given everything for you. 
I want to be afraid of pouring scorn on Jesus' sacrifice, of slapping him in the face with my sin. That is a holy fear. God is very scary when you are running from him or running against him, putting all your hope, all your desires, all your wishes somewhere else. But if you will hope fully in the grace that he gives and the treasure that he is, he will walk with you and be your friend and your protector and your father all the way home to eternity with him. So live in hope, live in holiness and live in holy fear. Let's pray. <clears throat> Most gracious and merciful Father, please forgive us for, for running away from you, for running against you, for pouring insult upon the unbelievable sacrifice and ransom that you have paid for us. Father, help us to live lives in this fallen world that mirror the image that is you. Help us to be true image bearers of your son, Jesus, in this world that needs to see you as you really are, that they might repent and turn to you. Father, we pray that you would help us to live out our lives in this most acceptable way, in the right way, the only way that repays the generosity that you have poured out upon us. We pray that you would help us to do this for Jesus' sake and for your glory. Amen.